Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God. And today I'd like to cover various doctrines, original beliefs of the Christian Church, and contrast some of those beliefs with some changes that occurred in uh, the Greco-Roman churches. This is based upon a book that we have called Beliefs of the Original Catholic Church. Uh, this book and any other book I may hold up is available free at the www.ccog.org website, ccog.org. Go to the site, the literature tab, click on books and booklets, and this will come up. You can read it online. We don't ask you for email address. Again, any other book or booklet I hold up uh, is free. Same, same conditions. Anyway, this particular book goes into a lot of details. A lot of people don't understand about early Christianity. Whether or not you have a Catholic or a Protestant or Orthodox background or none at all. If you're interested in the truth about early Christianity, this is a book documents from both the Bible and historical uh, sources. A lot of information that the mainstream just doesn't get. Now, I'm going to start off uh, talking about, uh, this is from actually chapter 10 from this particular book, uh, three days and three nights. You know, how long was Jesus in the grave? And throughout this sermon series, I'm using uh, Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox uh, translations of the Bible to demonstrate this is not some bias against them by using different uh, Bibles that they wouldn't normally use. Anyway, if you go to Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, and I'm going to read this from the uh, New Jerusalem Bible. Jesus said, For as Jonah remained in the belly of the sea monster... Uh, it's not really sea monsters, not a great translation, but we we'll use that here. For three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Now, it should be pointed out that despite what many people think, the Gospels do not say that Jesus was resurrected on a Sunday morning. When I was doing some more research on this chapter, I kept various, I came across a lot of writings from uh, Greco-Roman Protestant sources trying to explain for sure that the Bible teaches that Jesus was resurrected on a Sunday morning. And they didn't understand that the Bible doesn't say that. And let me give you an example. What they've done is misinterpreted. For example, John chapter 20, verse 1. Uh, again, I'll read this from the New Jerusalem Bible. states, It was very early on the first day of the week and still dark, when Mary of Magdala came to the tomb, she saw the stone had been moved away from the tomb. So she comes Sunday before sunrise, and she sees that the stone was gone, and she finally goes in there, she finds out there, you know, checks around the area, whatever, finds out Jesus isn't there. So because Jesus was not there before sunrise on Sunday, that does not mean he was resurrected on Sunday. It means he was not there Sunday morning. <laughs> now, the Greco-Roman saint Irenaeus referred to uh, three days and three nights for Jesus to be in the grave. I mention this because this is an idea that the Greco-Roman Protestants generally don't accept. They don't accept that Jesus was in the grave for three days and three nights. But somebody they consider to be a saint, or actually a very important saint, said, this is from his Against Heresies. But the case was that for three days he, that's Jesus, dwelt in the place where the dead were, as the prophet says concerning him. And the Lord himself says, As Jonas remained three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Irenaeus also wrote, For the judge of the whole world is thus proclaimed, who having been hidden in the heart of the earth in a tomb for three days. Now Passover, the year Jesus was killed, was on a Tuesday evening. And Jesus died in the afternoon on the day uh, we now call Wednesday. And according to Matthew 27, verses 46, this was the ninth hour of the day, which would be around 3 p.m. Uh, in modern time. Anyways, Jesus was resurrected three full days and three nights later on a Saturday afternoon. 
And he was put in the grave just before sunset. You see that in John 19.31. Uh, 40. And on a high holy day, according to John 19.31. So he would have left the grave shortly before sunset on Saturday. Yet I ran across a source. Uh, this is a Roman Catholic source trying to say it can, Jesus couldn't possibly be there for that long because he rose on the third day. And if it was three days and three nights, it's the fourth day. But it, think about this. How, how do we normally talk? Okay, let's see, okay Jesus was, uh, uh, died on Wednesday, put in the grave on Wednesday. So then we've got Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So after three days, he rose. Okay. <laughs> And the third day he rose, okay? That's how we would say it. But I saw a Roman Catholic source explain that proves that Jesus could not have been in the grave for 72 hours. Now, officially, instead of accepting three full days and three nights, the Greco-Romans changed. They and most Protestants have accepted a lesser time calculation that claimed a Friday afternoon crucifixion and a pre-dawn Sunday resurrection. And that was put forth in a fraudulent document called the Didascalia Apostolorum, which I've cited in this series before. Basically, it claims that these are statements from the uh, 12 apostles, and they simply didn't write, write this, and scholars know this. Now, a lesser calculation was also put forth by uh, Augustine, or Augustine of Hippo, and basically became accepted. I uh, ran across one article that falsely asserted, quote, three days and three nights begins upon the arrest. So they say, okay, three days and three nights started when Jesus was first arrested, not well when he uh, died or was put in the grave. And, but, you know, the Bible says Jesus is supposed to be in the heart of the earth. That's what Jesus said, and that does not include uh, being a uh, captive. Now, some Protestant scholars and other scholars realize their traditional understanding of this is off, and that Jesus was buried on a Wednesday and rose on a Saturday. And I have a citation in this book, as well as a book we have on Protestantism. Now, even in the 21st century, some Roman Catholics and other leaders have indicated that Jesus' last Passover, which they tend to call the Last Supper, was kept on a Tuesday night, and he was betrayed on a Wednesday. Now, some scholars seem to think that Jesus was held for two days before he was killed. But that differs from the biblical account. I don't think it, that's correct. That being said, several scholars realize that several ancient and questionable references outside the Bible support the idea of a Tuesday evening last Passover and an early Wednesday morning arrest of Jesus. Now, if they're questionable sources, why would I refer to them? Well, first of all, I found scholars that did. Even that Gita Scalia document, which I said is fraudulent, talked about a Tuesday Passover. So why would we refer to that document since you can't trust it? Well, the reality is, at that time when this was written, people still felt that Jesus was resurrected on what we call Tuesday, I mean, well, had his last Passover on what we call Tuesday. And it took a little while before they uh, got rid of that and switched it to Thursday <laughs> and uh, decided that uh, uh, Jesus was killed on a Friday. But even uh, with this uh, the Tuesday Passover, they went down that Jesus was held for a couple of days, which again, Scripture doesn't support that. But if you look at what we can find in ancient texts and biblical support and what the moon and the phase of the moon were like back in 30, 31 A.D., they all support that Jesus' last Passover was on a Tuesday. He was arrested early Wednesday morning, uh, died around 3 Wednesday afternoon. And we, the Continuing Church of God, believe that, that Jesus' last Passover was uh, Tuesday evening. He was arrested in the early morning hours of Wednesday. He died Wednesday afternoon. He was put in the grave just before sunset, or the tomb just before sunset on Wednesday. Uh, he rose from the dead on a Saturday afternoon. He left the heart of the earth just before sunset Saturday, which makes three days and three nights. And so the fact that the uh, Mary Magdala didn't come until 
uh, really early prior to dawn on Sunday, okay, that's fine. It doesn't prove that Jesus just left two minutes before she showed up. Okay, but many have misinterpreted that or decided that's what it means when there's no scriptural support for that. All right, now totally different subject. Abortion. What, what did early Christians think about this? Well, one of the earliest claim, claimed Christian writings outside the Bible is something called the Didache. Uh, and that's believed to have come from the 1st or 2nd century. Uh, first century, late 1st century, early 2nd century. And here's what it says. You shall not murder. You shall not be sexually promiscuous. You shall not abort a child or commit infanticide. Abortion was also considered to be murder by those who professed Christ in the 2nd and 3rd century. For example, uh, uh, Tertullian of Carthage in the late 2nd century he wrote, Christians, they accounted it murder for any woman by evil arts to procure abortion, to stifle the embryo, to kill a child in a manner before it's alive, or before it's born. Tertullian also wrote, but in regard to child murder, as it does not matter whether it's committed for a sacred object or merely for one's own self-impulse. So he's saying, you can't say you killed your child for God or something like that. He says it's still, it's still murder. So we see that even into the late second century, those who professed Christ considered abortion to be murder. Now this was also the case in the third century. But something happened over in Rome. Now there's a Roman Catholic saint by the name of Hippolytus who, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, was the most important theologian prior to uh, the time of Emperor Constantine. Anyway, he condemned a bishop of Rome, or some people would call Pope Callistus. And this guy is from the 3rd century. And here's what uh, uh, Hippolytus wrote in his book called Refutation of All Heresies. Callistus permitted females, if they were unwedded and burned with passion at an age at all events unbecoming, or if they were not disposed to overturn their own dignity through legal marriage, that they may have whoever they have chosen a bedfellow, whether a slave or free, and that woman, though not legally married, might consider such a companion as a husband. Whence, women reputed believers began to resort to drugs to produce ster sterility and to gird themselves round so to expel what was being conceived on account of their not wishing to have a child either by a slave or by any paltry fellow, you know, somebody who's not important, for the sake of their family and excessive wealth. Behold, into how great impiety that lawless one has proceeded by inculcating adultery and murder at the same time. So Hippolytus is saying, look, this bishop of Rome is a bad dude. Now, it's interesting, Hippolytus was also the bishop of Rome at the same time. And despite the fact Callistus supported abortion, the Church of Rome decided that they were going to have their succession through him instead of Hippolytus. Anyway, early religious writers who considered themselves Christian considered abortion to be murder and fornication to be adultery. The Bible doesn't give anybody the right to commit the fornication, adultery, or murder. Now the idea that abortion is murder is an original Christian or Catholic belief, despite the fact it was accepted by their, quote, Pope Callistus I. You say, well, that was just Hippolytus. Well, the Catholic Encyclopedia says, Callistus allowed the lower clergy to marry, and permitted noble ladies to marry low persons and slaves, which according to Roman law was forbidden. He, he had thus given occasion for infanticide. In other words, they said, Calistus set things up so people could kill their babies. Now, Calistus was not the only Roman, Greco-Roman leader to do this. I'm going to read something from the Encyclopedia of Catholicism. It has the following. 
like their Jewish contemporaries, second century Christian communities rejected abortion. Many early Christian writings like the Didache preach against abortion. And I cited that one already. Aristotle, a pagan by the way, said that human ensoulment did not take place until 40 days after conception for males and 80 for females. Aquinas, now he is a doctor of the Roman Catholic Church, is considered to be a saint. Aquinas accepted Aristotle's theory of late ensoulment. By late ensoulment they mean, okay, the baby's been conceived, but it takes a while before the soul supposedly enters it. Now, according to the Bible, the soul is the life. So as soon as it was alive, but anyway, Aquinas saw abortion of the unsold fetus as sin against marriage, but not murder. Okay, well, that's his worldly opinion, but it's not a biblical one. The famous medieval jurist Gratian wrote, He is not a murderer who brings about abortion before the soul is in the body. Now, this again is from uh, a, a Catholic source here. It's important to note that for roughly 500 years, the Catholic Church followed the teaching of Aristotle and St. Thomas on the status of the fetus. The Council of Vienna of 1312, under Pope Clement V, affirmed Aristotle's teaching on delayed hominization. Uh, hominization meaning when it becomes a person. But Aristotle was a pagan. He was before Christ. Now, that argument is similar to the argument that the abortion pushers used to make in the 1970s, that the fetus was not yet a human. But, of course, the fetus is an unborn human. And as far as ensoulment goes, being alive makes the fetus a living soul, which would be consistent with, for example, Genesis 2.7. Now, I've looked at some other uh, Roman Catholic information other Roman Catholic leaders, so let me read some other things about Roman Catholic support of abortion. St. Augustine declared that abortion is not homicide, but it was a sin if it was intended to conceal fornication or adultery. During the period of 600 to 1500 AD, illicit intercourse was deemed by the Irish canons to be a greater sin than abortion. Okay, so they thought uh, Abortion was, was not really that big of an issue. And here's something. Gregory VI, who was their pope from 1045 to 1046, said, He's not a murderer who brings about an abortion before the soul is in the body. And around 1213, their pope, Innocent III, denied abortion was murder. Here's something from a book called The Pope, who said abortion is not murder. St. Jerome was a doctor of the church, but Jerome wrote, the seed gradually takes shape in the uterus, and abortion does not count as killing until the individual elements have acquired their external appearance and limbs. Church canon law until 1917 accepted delayed ensoulment. So we see that various Roman Catholic leaders, uh, Aquinas and Augustine and Jerome and various popes allowed abortion. And that explains why you've got various American politicians, some other politicians saying they're, they're Catholic, Roman Catholic, yet they can support abortion. But you know a lot of uh, people don't want to don't hear that. All right, now I'm going to go to a, a book called The uh, Vicars of Christ. Said, in the 15th century, moralists began to ask whether it was not possible in certain circumstances to get rid of the fetus without fault. Some went further. They said it was permissible to save a mother's life even after the fetus was humanized. Gregory the 13th, 1572 to 1585, said it was not homicide to kill an embryo of less than 40 days since it was not human. His successor, the tempestuous Sixtus V, who rewrote the Bible, disagreed entirely. In his bull of 1588, he said all abortion, for whatever reason, were homicide and were penalized by excommunication reserved by the Holy See. Immediately after Sixtus died, Gregory XIV realized that the current state of theological opinion, Sixtus's view was too severe. In an almost unique decision, he said Sixtus's censures were to be treated as if they had 
he had never issued them. So yeah, there was every now and then somebody would be against it, but a lot of Roman Catholic pontiffs and scholars supported abortion, or at least said it wasn't murder. Now the Church of God position has not changed. We're opposed to abortion. You're not supposed to kill your babies. Anyway, I'm going to a variety of miscellaneous doctrine. The next one in the book is anti-Semitism. Now, Christianity, of course, was initially considered to be a, a sect of the Jews, but at least partially because of the Bar Kokhba revolt by the Jews, roughly 132 to 135 A.D., many who professed Christ dropped practices considered to be Jewish, and in time this led to uh, anti-Semitism. Now, in the second century, there was an apostate named uh, Marcion of Pontus, and he contributed to that because he insisted that the church had obscured the gospel by seeking to combine it with Judaism. Of course, the reality is the true church of God did combine the faith of Christ with practices that Marcion and others considered to be too Jewish. Now, history records that Marcion was condemned by Church of God leaders such as Polycarp, Melito, uh, Theophilus, and Serapion. So there are records that Church of God leaders, and we refer to those in this book, denounced Marcion. And by the way, those Church of God leaders are all considered to be saints by the Greco-Romans and the Protestants, for that matter. Now later we see anti-Semitism popping up from the pagan Roman Emperor Constantine, who is considered, by the way, a saint by the Eastern Orthodox, but not by the Roman Catholics. Now Constantine, after getting his decision in 325 that Passover should only be observed on a Sunday instead of the biblical date, at the same time Jesus would have kept it. As I say, Jesus' last Passover was a Tuesday night, so it was not on a Sunday. Anyway, Constantine stated, quote, Let us then have nothing in common with that detestable Jewish crowd, for we have received from our Savior a different way. Well, the different way from Jesus, who, by the way, according to the Bible, was Jewish, was basically Jesus taught more about emphasizing love, like, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. He never said to have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd. And Emperor Constantine's views also affected what his official church historian, Eusebius, taught. Now, as far as uh, anti-Semitism goes, in 387 A.D., there's an Eastern Orthodox saint and a bishop, John Chrysostom. And he preached uh, in a homily against the Jews, and there were there were eight anti-Semitic homilies. So I'll read some of his statements. And by the way, this John Chrysostom is considered to be great even by Protestants. Uh, Christianity Today is a Protestant publication to talk about how great Chrysostom was. But he said, or, Do not be surprised I call the Jews pitiable. They are really, really pitiable and miserable. So the godlessness of the Jews and the pagans is on par. But the Jews practice a deceit which is more dangerous. Do you see that demons dwell in their souls and that these demons are more dangerous than the ones of old? Again, as he's talking about Jews. Since it's against the Jews I wish to draw my battle line, let me extend my instruction further. Let me show that by fasting now the Jews dishonor the law and trample underfoot God's commands because they're always doing everything contrary to his degree. When God wished them to fast, they got fat and flabby. Well, actually the Bible commands the keeping of uh, of, of an annual fast for those who can uh, on the Day of Atonement and John Chrysostom was condemning people who were doing that. Then, uh, as a matter of fact, there's something else he said about it. Indeed, the fasting of the Jews is more disgraceful than any drunkenness. Uh, no, the Bible c condemns drunkenness clearly and uh, says fasting is a good thing to do and you're supposed to do it uh, when you can pretty good day of atonement. Uh, by the way, John Chrysostom, uh, not only is he considered to be a, a Greco-Roman and Protestant saint, 
he's one of the four doctors of the Roman Church, and when you see this big black uh, chair uh, called the uh, uh, Cathedral Petri in uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City, big huge black chair, he's one of the four pillars of their church. And you say, well, you don't know who he is, or you don't care, or, or you're, you're Protestant or something. But what about Protestant leaders? Early Protestant leaders, like Martin Luther and others, were also anti-Semites. Let me read some about Martin Luther's advice about Jews. He actually lists uh, seven things in one spot. I only read the first couple. What shall we Christians do with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews? Since they live among us, we dare not tolerate their conduct. I shall give you my sincere advice. Again, this is from Martin Luther. And by the way, um, we also have a book on uh, Protestantism, Hope of Salvation, How the Continuing Church of God Differs from Protestantism. And let me read some more from here. First, to set fire to their synagogues. This is again his uh, sincere advice, Martin Luther's. Or schools, and to burn and cover with dirt whatever will not burn, so that no man ever will see a stone or cinder of them. This is to be done in honor of the Lord of of Christendom. Jesus didn't say anything like that. Second, I advise that their houses also be raised and destroyed. And that is from Martin Luther. Now the rest of the seven things he said are all in this particular book, again available at ccog.org website, as well as some quotes from other Protestant leaders who were also anti-Semites. We in the Continuing Church of God condemn anti-Semitism. We hold the original Christian belief on this topic. And like uh, early Christians, as you can see in Galatians 2, 7, I'm not going to go there now, but we strive to reach Jews and Gentiles uh, about Jesus. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the other books that we have, I want to, I saw it today, I'm not, it was in my stack, I must have missed it for a second, let me see if I can find it here, and hold this one up. Proof Jesus is the Messiah. This is a book that, if you have any doubts about whether or not there was a Jesus, because sometimes you hear things that people cast doubt upon it, this can prove it. And by the way, if you're a Jew, or you're still Jewish, if you'll read this book, and particularly chapter 3, now chapter 1 and 2 is probably similar to what some Jews have heard about Jesus' proof, maybe they haven't accepted. But chapter 3 goes into early Jewish writings that support the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. And also in this book, in later chapters, we talk about predictions that Jesus made that were fulfilled outside the New Testament to prove that Jesus was a prophet of God and was sent by God because such things did and have come to pass. And more things Jesus said will come to pass. So not only are we not anti-Semites, we are trying to reach uh, Jews as well. And this book for Jews who are willing to look, has proof that Jesus is the Messiah, and for non-Jews willing to look, proves that Jesus is the Messiah. Next topic I covered, by the way, this chapter in the uh, in this book is called Miscellaneous Doctrines. It's called Hymns, next section in this part. And Book of James, James 5, verse 13. James teaches, Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. And in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, the Apostle Paul noted, Whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm. And I'd like to read something from the noted historian, uh, uh, K.S. Uh, Lateret. He observed, From a very early date, perhaps from the beginning, Christians employed in their services the psalms found in the Jewish scriptures the Christian Old Testament. Since the first Christians were predominantly Greek-speaking, these psalms were in a Greek translation. We hear of at least one form of service in which, after the reading of the Old Testament, the hymn of David were sung. Until the end of the 4th century, in the service this is of the Catholic Church, only Old Testament psalms and hymns or canticles from the New Testament were sung. Gradually, they were uh, prepared, they were prepared versical paraphrases. 
Well, reportedly, because of fears of being influenced by Gnostics, Christians didn't add outside uh, poetic phrases or non-biblical lyrics until sometime well after the second century, according to La Tourette. Now, on the Roman date of 7 March 2000, excuse me, 203, Tertullian uh, records that while being prepared for martyrdom, somebody by the name of Perpetua sang psalms. Now, I want to read something from a late 4th century publication known as the Apostolic Constitutions. Be not careless of yourselves, neither deprive your Savior of his own members, neither divide his body nor disperse his members, neither prefer the occasion of this life to the word of God, but assemble yourselves together every day morning and evening singing psalms and praying in the Lord's house in the morning and saying the 62nd Psalm, in the evening, the 140th, but principally on the Sabbath day. So Apostolic Constitutions, which is not a uh, canonical book and has its own issues, recognized or tell recognize the Sabbath day and said that's a, a day particularly to sing psalms. Even a church that was ruled by the Roman Greco-Romans, psalms were still sung on the Sabbath. And that most likely continuing the original practice that uh, even the Roman Greco-Roman Confederation got influenced by them. Now in the continuing church of God, our psalms are mainly our hymns are mainly psalms set to music. Uh, we've also got other hymns based on biblical, mostly New Testament pack, uh, passages. And you can find this uh, online as well. Next subject I've got in here is ecumenism. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'll give you a moment to get there because I'm going to read a lot. Start in verse 14. Bible warns. Do not, oh, this will be from the uh, New Jerusalem Bible, Roman Catholic translation. Do not harness yourselves in an uneven team with unbelievers. How can uprightness and law breaking by, be partners? Or what light, what can light and darkness have in common? How can Christ come to an agreement with Belair? And what sharing can there be between a believer and an unbeliever? The temple of God cannot compromise with false gods, and that which is, and that is what we are, the temple of the living God. We have God's word for it. I shall fix my home among them and live among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Get away from them. Purify yourselves, says the Lord. Do not touch anything unclean. Then I shall welcome you. I shall be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Almighty Lord. Polycarp of Smyrna, who's considered to be a saint by the Greco-Roman Protestants and the Church of God, also warned against ecumenism. And here's an interpretation from a, a, a Catholic Greco-Roman writer. Polycarp, in his letter to the Philippians, invites his recipients to abandon the vanity of the multitude and their false doctrines, to return to the word that was transmitted from the beginning. By warning about the vanity of the multitude, Polycarp was admonishing the Church of God to be separate. And a distance, a separation occurred throughout history. Both Polycrates of Ephesus and Serapion of Antioch were also witnesses to this separation during the third century, as plus Polycarp. Again, these are Church of God leaders. Now, since most of the many who claim Polycarp was a saint of their faith, but they don't have the same teachings or practices that Polycarp did. Nor will they do, as it says in Jude 3, keep the word which was handed down from the beginning. Now, Pope Francis of Rome and the ecumenical patriarch of uh, Constantinople, Bartholomew, have pushed for unity despite doctrinal differences that don't align with, don't align with biblical teaching or the teachings of the original Catholic Church. They've also supported 
uh, major efforts by the United Nations and the World Council of Churches uh, to put together basically some type of a one world government as well as various biblically moral positions. Now, not all who are associated with the Greco-Roman churches are supportive of this. Um, I'd like to take the time to read something from uh, a couple of uh, uh, Greco-Roman, excuse me, Greek Orthodox bishops. These are uh, bishops from uh, Greece itself. Here's what they wrote to Pope Francis. Your ex Excellency is a favorite of the Freemasons, who, according to their own publication, were anxiously awaiting your election and rejoiced when you were chosen. In a statement by the Grand Master G. Raff, Raffi, he stresses that, quote, with Pope Francis, nothing will be as it was before. It's a clear choice of fraternity for a church of dialogue, which is not contaminated by the logic and the temptations of the temporal power. Fraternity and the desire to dialogue were his first concrete words. Perhaps nothing in the church will be as it was before. Again, this is from the Greek Orthodox quoting the Freemason leader. The simple cross he wore on his white cossack lets us hope that a church of the people will rediscover its capacity to dialogue with all men of goodwill and with Freemasonry, which, as the experiences of Latin America teaches us, works for the good and progress of humanity. So this is the quote. Then the Greek Orthodox bishop says, for here's the heart of the matter. Dialogue with all men of goodwill which means an intensifying ecumenism. Are you not aware, Your Excellency, Pope Francis, that Freemasonry promotes through ecumenism the universal religion of Lucifer, as well as the fact that the source and womb of Freemasonry is the hideous international Zionism. So we're seeing some type of anti-Semitism in this part. Anyway, this bishop, these two bishops, Greek Bishops continue with, Freemasonry is pagan cult worship and the adversary of the pure Orthodox Church. That is to say, it's clearly anti-Christian and a pagan religion. The Masons are Satan worshippers and Lucif Luciferists following followers of the religion of, the, of Antichrist. You, Your Excellency, have not ceased from the moment of your election to speak in glowing terms about the religions of the world, to call them to collaborate for the good of mankind. It's obvious why you decided to lead the effort in uni uniting the religions of the world, believing that you too can become their leader. The Holy See is leading the way in the creation of a one world religion, supposedly for the good of the world. In essence, however, it will be for its devastation. Ecumenism adopts and legitimizes all heresies as churches and insults the dogma of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And in a lot of these points, these Greek bishops are correct. You say, oh, any Roman Catholic views on any of this? Yeah, I want to read something from the Roman Catholic Archbishop Carlo Maria uh, Vigano. And he wrote, quote, The Holy See has deliberately renounced the supernatural mission of the Church, making itself the servant of the New World Order and uh, Masonic globalism in an Antichrist counter magisterium. The same Roman discarderies occupied by people ideologically aligned with Jorge Mario uh, Bergoglio, that's uh, Pope Francis, and protected and promoted by him, now continue unrestrained in their implacable work of demolishing faith, morals, ecclesiastical discipline, monastic and religious life, in an effort as vain as it is unprecedented to transform the Bride of Christ into a fill Traffic or association enslaved by the strong powers. The result is a superimposition over the true church association of a sect of heretical and depraved modernists who are intent on legitimizing adultery, sodomy, abortion, euthanasia, idolatry, and any perversion of intellect and will. So this was uh, reported by... Uh, LifeSite News, uh, April 20th, 2021. It's pretty recent. Uh, and the uh, Roman Catholic Cardinal uh, Burke uh, criticized the notion of a one-world uh, government. 
It says the idea of one world government is fundamentally the same phenomena that was displayed by the builders of the Tower of Babel, who presumed to exercise the power of God on earth to unite heaven and earth, which is simply incorrect, he said. Now, in the continuing Church of God, we believe that there is a one world government coming uh, that's to be warned against, but there's also one that's going to come to solve the problems of humanity, and that's the good news of the kingdom of God. You see, we have a booklet on this, and this particular booklet has been translated into over 100 languages. If you go to the ccog.org website, instead of going to the literature tab on top, if you just continue down on the page, you'll see uh, the 100 plus languages listed there. You can click on the language and read it in your language, or perhaps send it to somebody who doesn't read English, uh, who you know who knows one of those other languages. That's the true one world government, the only one that we can rely on, yet the Bible warns about one that is going to rise up. And this is what's going on now, and, and some, even within the Greco-Roman world, see this. Now, as far as the Church of Rome goes, I want something that came out in 2020, and this actually came out in December of 2020. Here's what this article says. The Pontifical Council, Council for Promoting Christian Unity has a field of a handbook, three years in the making, entitled The Bishop and Christian Unity, an Ecumenical Vatimicum. The Vatican is at least becoming more forthright. It no longer hesitates to point out that it breaks with its own tradition as it openly prescribes acts regarded by our forebearers as intrinsically evil, as in gra gravely sinful in themselves, as in inadmissible. No obfuscation, just brazen novelty. From number 17 of the document, it says, for example, this is the ecumenical uh, that had come from the Vatican, Catholics not only can, but indeed must seek out opportunities to pray with other Christians. Certain forms of prayer are particularly appropriate. The ancient Christian practice of praying the Psalms and scriptural canticles together, the prayer of Christ, is a tradition. Now this article says, let's revisit the particular moral act in past church teachings and legislation. Here's a quick flyover, mind you. So what I'm going to read here is from this article. These are teachings that the Church of Rome had before about this kind of stuff. No one shall pray in common with heretics and schismatics. That's from the Synod of uh, Laodicea 363. No one must either pray or sing psalms with heretics. That's the Council of Carthage in 397. Now those are not just Roman Catholic. Those are Greek Orthodox as well for those particularly. It is not listed for Catholics to attend or take part in an active way in a non-Catholic ceremony. This is from Canon Law in 1917. That's Roman Catholic. And in all these meetings and conferences, any communication whatsoever in worship must be avoided. That's from the Congregation of the Holy Office in 1949. Now this article says, with these few in mind, reread the Vatimicum quote above. What else is there to say? And it, here's a quote. Yes, what we once thought was evil, but not anymore, now is a moral imperative. So some Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox are saying, hey, wait a second, stuff that we said was wrong was sinful. You guys are saying we need to do. It's important to do. As a matter of fact, uh, the head of the Orthodox Church, uh, or Bartholomew, because they have different ones they consider to be their head, but he's gone out and said that basically, as has the Pope, that you're basically working for the devil if you don't uh, support their ecumenical efforts. Now, perhaps I should mention that when this uh, ecumenical uh, Vatimacum came out, I denounced it and also did a, uh, a sermonette video about it. And as I looked in the details, they don't want a church like the Continuing Church of God, is it? Uh, uh, they and the World Council of Churches have declared a different... If you, only if you accept a type of the Godhead that was accepted at the councils uh, in uh, uh, 381 AD, uh, do they want you to be part of them? So they don't want the continuing church of God because we're not going to change on the Godhead. I plan on doing a, a sermon 
created this book on the Godhead later, but uh, it's also discussed in the Protestant book uh, on this, those matters. Anyway, we in the Continuing Church of God are not involved in the ecumenical or interfaith movements. We have no intention uh, to be, and so we differ uh, from the Vatican and the Eastern Orthodox and a lot of Protestant churches uh, who want to do this kind of stuff. Now that doesn't mean we can't have areas of cooperation with other groups or that everything that they're working on is not good. Uh, there are times and projects and stuff uh, that we can uh, work on sometimes together to help the poor, let's say, or some other kinds of uh, things. But we, in the continuing Church of God, believe only having agreement on true biblical doctrine is the way to reunite in what would be called an ecumenical fashion. Now, one major difference between the continuing Church of God and the Greco-Roman Protestant churches has to do with warfare and violent sports. Uh, many may be surprised to learn that early Christians would not participate in carnal warfare. And they wouldn't watch uh, various sporting events, uh, violent sporting events. The anyway, way Jesus taught, I'm going to go to John 18, read verse 36. This is from the New Jerusalem Bible. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my men would have fought. As it is, my kingdom does not belong here. And again, I'm holding up the book that we have on the kingdom of gospel, the kingdom of God, which is the good news. Now I want to read something from the first century. This is from something that's called First Clement. It says, let us cleave, therefore, to those who cultivate peace with godliness and not to those who hypocritically profess to desire it. Yes, there's a difference between those who cultivate peace and those who actively engage in war while claiming that they want peace. In the second century, the Greco-Roman Saint Justin Martyr taught, we who formerly used to murder one another do not only now refrain from making war upon our enemies, but also we may not lie. So he says, look, so even the Greco-Romans like Justin said you weren't supposed to be involved in war if you claimed Christianity. Now the Church of God bishop or pastor, Theophilus of Antioch, around 180 AD, wrote about false accusations about Christians and the truth. And he wrote in his uh, to Autolycus book 3, chapter 15, Consider, therefore, whether those who teach such things can possibly live indifferently and be commingled in unlawful intercourse or, most impious of all, eat human flesh. Christians were accused of eating human flesh because of doing the Passover. Especially when we are forbidden so much as to witness the shows of gladiators. They wouldn't watch them, sporting, violent sporting events, lest we become partakers and abettors of murders. But neither may we also see other spectacles, lest their eyes be defiled, participating in the utterance there sung. Now he says you're, that if you watch violent sports, you're abetting them, you are encouraging, you're assisting in the violence. So it's why we in the Canadian Church of God do not believe Christians should be watching sports where if they're play, played correctly, involve hurting people, okay? Intentionally hurting people. Now, I'm not talking about an accident. If, like, for example, you, uh, let's say baseball and someone uh, slides into somebody, hurts somebody. We're talking about sports where they're intentionally banging into people, uh, punching people, those kind of things, hitting people. Things that cause damage when the sport's played properly, permanent damage a lot to a lot of the people who participate. That's not love. It's not Philadelphian love. It's not appropriate. In the late second century, uh, uh, Tertullian, the historian, wrote, Christians held it unlawful to be present in gladiatorial sports where men's lives were so wantonly sacrificed to the pleasure and curiosity of the people. Now that's also the position in the third century by uh, Hippolytus, who I mentioned before, was a Roman theologian and bishop. And he goes various occupations, he says, that Christians can't be. This is from his uh, some called the Apostolic Tradition of Hippolytus. A charioteer, likewise, or one who takes part in games, 
or one who goes to the games, he shall cease or be rejected. So you couldn't participate, you couldn't watch him, or you weren't supposed to be considered a Christian. If someone is a gladiator, or one who teaches among the gladiators how to fight, or a hunter who is in the wild beast shows in the arena, or a public official who is concerned with the gladi gladiator shows, he shall either cease or be rejected. If someone is a priest of idols or an attendant of idols, he shall cease or he will be rejected. A military man in authority must not execute men. If he is ordered, he must not carry it out, nor must he take military oath. If he refuses, he shall be rejected. If someone's a military governor or ruler of a city who wears the purple, he shall cease or be rejected. The catechumen or faithful who wants to be a soldier is to be rejected, for he, is, he has despised God. That's the position of Greco-Roman saint. In around 250 A.D., Church of God elder, presbyter, if you will, Peonius of Smyrna asked, well, says, to whom have we as Christians done wrong? Have we perchance murdered someone? Or, or do we persecute anyone? Or have we obliged anyone to venerate idols? He said, look, we don't make you guys do anything. We don't kill you. We're not, because Christians, we don't do this. But that, the same can't be said of the Greco-Romans or the Lutherans or many other Protestants. It can be of the continuing Church of God. We're not persecutors. Now, I want to go to Galatians 5. Now, in this case, the uh, Orthodox Standard Bible is the same as the New King James Bible. Galatians 5, verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, then hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, which I told you beforehand, so I told you in the past. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice military behaviors will not be in the kingdom of God. Um, I'm going to read Hebrews 12.14. I'm going to read it from the uh, OSB and the NJB. The OSB says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see God. Now the New Jerusalem Bible, Roman Catholic translation says, Hebrews 12.14, Seek peace with all people and the holiness, without which no one can ever see the Lord. You can't, Observe those things if you're engaging in carnal warfare. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 7.15 that God has called us to peace. 2 Corinthians 13.11, you don't have to go there. Paul wrote, Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Now let's go to Romans chapter 12. I'll read several verses starting in verse 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, where it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not over, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Vengeance is God, and Christians are supposed to live peaceably. Now, it's true that the resurrected saints will help Christ crush his enemies. You can see that in Jude 14 and 15. The saints will be changed then. We won't be physical humans, according to what you read in 1 Corinthians 15 and uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, in 1 Peter 3, I'll read verses 10 and 11, Peter wrote about, Christian behavior in this life. 1 Peter 3, starting verse 10. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. In Romans 13.10, the Apostle Paul wrote, Love does no harm, to a neighbor. 
Now, what did John the Baptist in Luke 3.14 tell military members? Military, you know, people are members of the military. It says, And the soldiers also asked him, saying, And what shall we do? And he, that's John the Baptist, said to them, Do violence to no man, neither calumniate, falsely accuse, any man, and be content with your pay. Well, there's no way a soldier cannot do violence to somebody if they're trying to kill them. And let's go to Matthew chapter 5. I want to read a couple comments from Jesus. This will be from the uh, New American Bible Revised Edition, except by the Roman Catholics. It comes from the American Bishops Association, I think. Matthew 5, starting verse 21. You heard that it was said to your ancestors, you shall not kill, and whoever kills would liable for judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, will be answer, answerable to the Sanhedrin. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to fiery Gehenna. You don't have to go there, but Matthew 19, verse 18, Jesus said, you shall not murder. Jesus' comments in Matthew 5 demonstrate he expanded the restrictions against murder. Those expansions generally don't condone carnal warfare, nor encourage violence in sports. And uh, many get inappropriately angry, by the way, who are fans of uh, violent sports. In Revelation 9, excuse me, Revelation 13, starting in verse 9, Apostle John was inspired to write, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Notice that until the end, the saints are to be patient and not be among those who kill with the sword. Is it any wonder that Martin Luther discounted the literal understanding of the book of Revelation? Otherwise, he and his followers would have had to change their position on warfare. Like the original Catholics, the Greco-Romans tended to be pacifists until around the time of the rise of Emperor Constantine. He had his soldiers paint crosses on their shields at the Battle of uh, Milvian Bridge in 312. And the Roman, Greco-Romans changed their views on warfare pretty much after the influence of uh, Constantine. Let me read something from a book. According to the view of many historians, the Constantinian shift turned Christianity from a persecuted into a persecuting religion. Well, no, the true religion was never supposed to change. Some people became part of the persecuting church. But the Church of God did not. As early as the 5th century, there St. Augustine of Hippo was considering the moral consequences of war. He was one of the first to come up with this philosophical statement on war and justice known as the Just War Doctrine. And there were others who came up with this, uh, like Plato did. Again, another pagan. A lot of the changes that the Greco-Roman churches did originally came from Greek pagan philosophers. Now, despite the Greco-Romans accepting the views of Constantine, Plato, and other pagans, uh, those associated with the Church of God, as well as some who were not, didn't believe that Christians were supposed to be militaristic. For example, I'm going to read some quotes about different ones. The Cathari, one of the charges made against the they made against the established church was that it countenanced war in martial army. So the Cathari said, you Greco-Romans are wrong. You're not Christians because you're, putting, you're supporting the ar armies. And here's some, the, the Catholic Encyclopedia says, the heresy of the Bogomils started in the 10th century. The followers called themselves Christians and considered their faith the only true one. In Bosnia, they were named Paterines. The Paterines or Bogomils forbade intercourse with those of other faiths, disbelieved in war. So they were not ecumenical, and they were against warfare. Let me read something else. It's been reckoned that in the last and most savage persecution under Emperor Diocletian, about 2,000 Christians perished worldwide. But in the first incident of Pope Innocent's crusade, ten times that number of people were slaughtered. Not all were Albigensians. It comes a shock to discover, at a stroke of a pen, a pope killed far more Christians than Diocletian. 
Here's something uh, from a Protestant scholar. The next major step in the establishment of the Inquisition was taken by Innocent III. In the West, the same pope launched a crusade against the Cathars or Albigenses in southern France. Now, some people with those names are Church of God, true Christians. In the second century, the Christian era, most Christians refused to take up arms at all. Well, true Christians never did. One millennial later, Christians were not only fighting for the church against the infidels who conquered the ancient biblical lands, but against other Christians, heretical ones, who only asked to live in peace in their ancestral soil. Well, the true Christians didn't fight. It was the other ones who fought against them. But he says, no matter how dreadful, this is the Protestant scholars, the use of violence against the Albigenses was, it must be acknowledged their heresies, incompatible with Christianity, indeed with biblical religion as such, well, that's wrong. Early Christians who understood the Bible and the New Testament didn't believe in warfare, yet we've got a, Catholic, a Protestant scholar supporting it. But, but he does admit this. Perhaps for the medieval popes, the crucial factor, the crucial factor that caused them to condemn dissidents was really the dissidents' rejection of papal authority. And that's true. Church of God leaders would not accept bishops of Rome as having spiritual authority over them. And that's one of the reasons they were killed. Uh, here's something else. Waldenses. Their opposition to bearing arms into war in all his operations was unanimous and unequivocal. Whoever commanded them to feel, they refused to obey, alleging that they could not conscientiously comply. So they were conscientious objectors. And here's something from the Catholic Encyclopedia. As early as the 10th century, Empress Theodora had put to death a multitude of Paulicians, some of which are Church of God, and in 1118, Emperor Alexis Comenus treated the Boga Mills with equal, equal severity. By the way, it's reported that the multitude that Empress Theodora killed, she's Eastern Orthodox, was about 100,000. Even prior to this, those who held Church of God doctrines didn't care for the Eastern Orthodox, who they usually they sometimes called Byzantines, and they called it the Byzantine Empire. Here's something from an Arabic source reported about what uh, Sabbath keepers felt about them, about the Byzantines. It says Christian uh, Judaizantes, this is Christians who kept the Sabbath. At the end of the 4th and the 5th, and probably also in the 6th centuries, many mainly were concerned to put an end to Byzantine rule, which they hated, and the persecutions that tended to go along with it. Those who read and understand the New Testament realize that persecuting was not, being, not correct and being part of carnal warfare was wrong. Now in the 13th century, the Roman Catholic St. Thomas Aquinas had listed some of the objectives he was told Christians should have toward war. Now, he didn't agree with them, but here's what he said. Number one, objection one. It would seem it's always sinful to wage war because punishment is not inflicted except for sin. Now, those who wage war are threatening by our Lord with punishment, are threatened by our Lord with punishment. In Matthew 26, 52, all who take up the sword will perish with the sword. Therefore, all wars are unlawful. Objection two. Further, whatever is contrary to divine precepts is sin. War is contrary to divine Precept, for it's written in Matthew 5, 39, but I say to you to resist evil. In Romans 12, 19, not revenging yourself, my dearly beloved, but, but give place unto wrath. Therefore, war is always sinful. Objection 3. Further, nothing except sin is contrary to an act of virtue. But war is contrary to peace. Therefore, war is always sin. Again, this is Thomas Aquinas. He's listing objections he was told about Christians being involved in warfare, but he decided to accept the just war concept anyway. What about Protestants? Well, Martin Luther and his followers also endorsed military service and warfare. Furthermore, they condemned Anabaptists in uh, 1530 for not accepting their view of civil service. Here's what they said. Anabaptists, they teach it's uh, unlawful, they teach that lawful civil ordinances and good works of God uh, uh, they say that uh, it's wrong to engage in just wars and serve as soldiers. They condemn the Anabaptists because of this. 
Okay, so the Anabaptists say Christians were supposed to do this, and the Lutherans condemned them. Because Martin Luther was a militaristic person who killed many as well, and some of that's documented in this free book, uh, Pope of Salvation, How the Continuing Church of God Differs from Protestantism. By the way, we in the Continuing Church of God are not Protestant. We are not Greco-Roman Catholic. We represent the true Christian faith. Uh, yes, we're imperfect, but we represent this, and if you will be willing to examine our teachings in the light of the Bible, you will see that if you if you have a willing heart. You truly seek the truth. All right, I think the last thing I want to talk about has got to do with clean and unclean meats. So I want to read 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and through 16. Peter wrote, Do not allow yourselves to be shaped by the passions of your old ignorance, but as obedient children, be yourselves holy in all your activity, after the model of the Holy One who calls us. Since Scripture says, Be holy, for I am holy. Now, where's the first time in the Bible, by the way, Peter, Peter's referring to, says to be holy for God's holy? Well, it's in Leviticus chapter 11, verses 44 and 45, where God warns about uh, eating unclean meat, says not to do it. Now, as far as being holy as God is holy, it's only mentioned three more times in, in the Hebrew Bible. Next time is in uh, Leviticus 19, verse 2. Uh, where it discusses the Sabbath, by the way. The second is Leviticus 27, where it teaches about not being involved with witchcraft and says you should keep God's statutes. So does your uh, church teach that to be holy, you're supposed to keep the Sabbath or not eat unclean meat? Probably not, if you're not uh, part of the church of God. Anyway, and the final time is in Leviticus 20, verses 20 to 25, where God explains again about avoiding unclean animals and being holy. So what else could Peter have been taught? What could Peter have been talking about? Well, the only subject in the Old Testament could have been the unclean meat, the seventh-day Sabbath, statues of God, and mourning against witchcraft. But notice that the context of what Peter wrote had to do with lusts. Lust is unlawful desire. Apparently, Peter's including desire for eating things which are unlawful. Now, let's go to uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. Because Paul emphasized that Christians were not to be unclean nor be misled by those who didn't teach that. First, let's, first Thessalonians 4, starting verse 7. I'll be reading this from the Dewey Rames Bible. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto sanctification. Therefore, he that despises these things despises not man, but God. He who despises these things despises not man, but God, who has given his Holy Spirit in us. And by the way, as the Apostle said in the book of Acts chapter 5, God gives his Holy Spirit to those who obey him. You know, obey God, you don't have you won't have God's Holy Spirit. Now, let's go to uh, Leviticus 20. I allude to it, alluded to it, but I want to read verses 25 and 26. Therefore, do you also separate the clean beast from the unclean and the clean fowl from the unclean? Defile not your souls with beasts or birds or anything that moves on the earth, which I have shown you to be unclean. You shall be holy unto me because I, the Lord, am holy. And I have separated you from other people that you should be mine. So yes, you might be in a culture that eats unclean meat. Peter said there's some things you did in your ignorance. You're not supposed to do. God has separated us. That's one of the reasons we're not part of the ecumenical movement. I've mentioned this before, but I'll just read 2 Corinthians uh, 6, verse 17. Paul wrote, Wherefore, go out from among them, be you separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And in Revelation chapter 22, verse 11, the Apostle John was inspired to write, Meanwhile, let the sinner continue sinning, and the unclean continue to be unclean. Let the upright continue in his uprightness, and those who are holy continue to be holy. So notice the, the holy is distinguished from the unholy, and the clean from the unclean. And if you went to uh, 
Revelation 22, verse 11. I'm going to read verse 15 now. Dewey Rames. Without our dogs, those who do not enter the city of God, and sorcerers and unchaste and murderers and servants of idols, for everyone who loves and makes a lie. In my view, those who believe God's people are supposed to eat biblically unclean animals are accepting a lie. Now consider that dogs are biblically unclean. Uh, and they eat any type of animal. And they're not to be emulated in the last chapter of the Bible. You know, Paul did not want uh, Gentile Christians to participate in uncleanness. And that's something he should repent of, they should repent of. We're going to go to Ephesians 5, starting with verse 5. For know this and understand that no fornicator or unclean or covetous person which the serving of idols hath inheritance in the kingdom of God and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things comes the anger of God upon the children of unbelief. Be you not partakers with them. So we wouldn't eating biblically prohibited foods uh, be a sign of disobedience? Paul further warned that uncleanness is a work of the flesh in Galatians 5.19. Peter added, let's go to 2 Peter 2, starting verse 9. The Lord knows how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be tormented, and especially those who walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Sadly, many despise proper biblical authority. They think they can eat whatever they want. But what about arguments related to Acts chapter 10? What Peter stated, he understood from that, is that God did not want him to call Gentiles common or unclean. You can read that in Acts 10, verse 28. He didn't say it meant he should eat unclean animals, and he didn't eat them, and we have no record of any early uh, true Christian doing this. And even Al or Origin of Alexandria uh, taught that after the resurrection, Peter did not believe he could eat unclean meats. Origen wrote, and he's a great scholar as far as the Greco-Romans are concerned and the Protestants. Peter himself seems to have observed for a considerable time the Jewish observance enjoined the law of Moses. Peter went up to the upper room to pray about the sixth hour, became very hungry, and would have eaten. Peter's representative is still observing the Jewish customs respecting clean and unclean animals. So Origen understood that. And again, Peter never ate unclean meat. It says in Acts 10, 14. Now, in order to be allowed back in Jerusalem after the Bar Kokhba result in 135 AD, Roman soldiers said professors of Christ needed to eat unclean animals like they did. And so some changed at that time. They followed a Latin bishop by the name of Marcus and did so, but true Christians uh, didn't do it. Uh, now, despite Marcus's compromising, even the Greco-Roman Saint Irenaeus in 180 wrote that there were still unclean animals. Uh, let me read, read through this. He wrote, Now the law has figuratively predicted all these, delineating man by the various animals, whatsoever these, says the scripture, have a double hoof and ruminate. It proclaims as clean, but whatever does not possess one or the other of these properties, it's unclean. The unclean are those which do neither divide the hoof nor ruminate. But as to those animals which do chew the cud, but have not have double hooves, they themselves are unclean. The Lord says, Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I say to you? For, for men of this stamp do indeed say they believe in the Father and Son, but they never mediate as they should upon the things of God, neither are they adored with works of righteousness, but as I've already observed, they've adopted the lives of swine and dogs, giving themselves over to filthiness, to gluttony, eating things they shouldn't, too much, recklessness of all sorts, justly, therefore, did the apostles call such carnal. So he's saying here that you know, there's clean and unclean things. Even though he endorsed not, eat, you know, to avoid unclean meats, 
Shortly thereafter, the Greco-Romans say that their pope, bishop, because they weren't really called popes then, Eleutherus made the pronouncement that all animal flesh could be eaten. And you can find this in Roman Catholic writings. Well, think about this. This is like 150 years after Jesus was resurrected, according to the Roman Catholics, that they finally said it was okay to eat pork, which means they realized that the original Christians, including the Gentiles, because Rome's a Gentile area, did not and would not eat pork. Now, despite this Bishop of Rome's pronouncement, Church of God Christians continued to avoid unclean meat. In 250, roughly, Peonius of uh, Ephesus stated he was part of the Catholic Church and he refused to eat biblically unclean meat. So that shows he was not part of the same Catholic Church that uh, people claim Eleutherus was in. Anyway, Peonius was put to death for that. And uh, one Protestant scholar who actually endorses eating unclean meat wrote, quote, For centuries, Christians stayed away from pork and other in unclean food. Now this guy still believes you're supposed to do it, but he understood for centuries. Okay, more than 200 years, Christians understood this. Well, true Christians still understand it. Furthermore, in the 4th century, after Church of God Christians had moved to Jerusalem, they would need unclean meat. Now, in order to change that, Emperor Constantine said, if they would not eat unclean meat, they should be killed. Okay, if they've told, if you need to eat pork or be killed. Which again shows true Christians were still avoiding unclean meat. So anyone who tries to go through vain arguments that unclean meat was done away with in the New Testament is not true. They're having you go believe something that's not true. Early Christians did not believe it. And you know, I've touched on some other things throughout this sermon early Christians believed. They did believe that Jesus was in the grave uh, for three days and for three nights. Uh, they did believe Passover was on a, on a Tuesday, the one that Jesus kept. They were not anti-Semitic. Uh, okay? They were not ecumenical. Uh, they didn't eat biblically unclean meat. Again, we document all these types of things in these free online books for those who want more information. They're available at the ccog.org website. Believe the Bible, and if you have been confused or been confused by vain arguments, understand if you are willing to look at the truth about early Christian history, you can find the true doctrines of the church, doctrines that we, the continuing church of God, strive to teach others. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.